everyone. My name is Darren Klaas. I'm an interventional radiologist at Vancouver General Hospital and UBC Hospital. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about TAPI dissection. Because it's such an expansive topic, I've decided to separate out these talks into essentially three different talks. The first one is this one, which is essentially a summary of imaging modalities, which to use when, uh, some tips and tricks on setting up protocols, and then some problem solving, and also a little bit about the timing of the, of the imaging with regards to type B dissection. We know dissection is a very low incident but very high complication rate disease. It can begin as an intramural hematoma. The entry tear is often around the left subclavian artery but can be anywhere. It can begin as a complex intimal tear distal to the left subclavian artery but it'll often have multiple fenestrations along its length and there are always fenestrations in the perivisceral abdominal aorta. The issue with dissection is that it leads to weakening of the aorta because you've torn the intima and the inner layer of the media away from the outer layer of the media and the adventitia, which leaves the aorta inherently weakened. And what that leads is to interval growth of the aorta. It leads to inflammation in the aorta, which can lead to extension of the dissection both proximally and distally. And therefore you can actually develop malperfusion uh, in a delayed fashion or a retrograde dissection. And because of all of this, these patients carry a very, very high mortality rate. 20 to 42% of patients who present with acute type B dissections have a five-year mortality, you know, anywhere from, from, like I say, 20 to 42%. So it's a very high um, complication rate disease. We've looked for many years at ways to try and predict failure. And you'll see this um, study, both in this talk and the subsequent one, but in this paper, 45% of patients failed optimal medical therapy at five years. The common thread, diabetes, renal failure, a Debakey type 3B dissection, and in a large aortic diameter. And when you, when you look at these retrospective studies, 86 patients treated over essentially a 12-year period. 22 patients initially, so 25% were complicated, and... 64% uh, of patients, sorry, 64 patients uncomplicated. Um, but overall, more than 28% of patients suffer from delayed complications, firstly within the first 14 days with a median of seven days. 10 had malperfusion, three rupture, eight early expansion. Two patients had refractory pain and one patient uncontrolled hypertension. And again, the morphological risk factors in all of these patients, large entry tear, true lumen collapse, partial false lumen thrombosis, and an aortic diameter of over four centimeters. And the patients who ruptured had a 12.5% mortality. And when you look at dissection mortality, this is a survival curve, looking at patients treated with medication, TVAR or open surgery, four-year survival, 35%, five-year survival, 40%. But essentially what this shows is that you know, whatever you do for these patients, if you don't treat them optimally initially, these patients have an increasing mortality trend. And so what you're trying to do is identify patients who are at risk of progression and treat those patients intelligently. And again, morphological factors in this patient subset, big aorta and big false lumen. So in other words, if you can identify patients who are at high risk and prevent aneurysmal degeneration, by thrombosing the false lumen and stimulating positive remodeling of the aorta, you're likely to improve their long-term survival. Can we make a difference? Yes, both if we, if we look at the aortic size and flow in the false lumen as parameters for progression, we can make a difference. Here's a good example. This is a patient who remotely had a uh, intramural hematoma, then was sent to us with an expanding thoracic aorta due to uh, flow within a limited portion of that false lumen. So, you know, whether you call this a penetrating aortic ulcer, essentially what it is, is that it's just a mature focus of flow within the aortic false lumen. Uh, and this patient had ongoing back pain and we decided to treat this patient because of the aortic expansion and also the ongoing back pain that we couldn't control with medical therapy. It's a patient with renal failure. And in these patients, I tend to do MRI because the, the lack of nephrotoxicity just makes it a lot easier to manage these patients and not to give them another problem to deal with. So uh, aneurysmal aorta, big penetrating ulcer, whatever you want to call that thing, uh, needed to be treated. And so this is the time result MR showing flow within that residual false lumen. Uh, and then we deployed a, uh, a series of gore CTAG graphs under uh, 
intravascular ultrasound guidance, you can see there in the middle picture that Ivis catheter just at the origin of the branch aortic arch vessel. Uh, we deployed the distal graft first because this was slightly smaller and the larger graft proximally in order to, to create a seal. And so I wouldn't recommend this routinely, but uh, if you've got experience and you know exactly where you're landing that distal stent, you're not going to pressurize your false lumen. It's safe. And then this is the time resolved MRI and steady state MRI post stent graft showing early remodeling, so positive remodeling that aorta is already getting smaller and complete exclusion of that false lumen. So I'm going to talk to you now about uh, CT, transophageal echo, MRI, and intravascular ultrasound. CT angiography is the mainstay of emergency acute imaging because it's fast, it's reproducible, it's easy to access it. You get a complete aortic assessment very, very quickly, and you can characterize tissue. The problem is it's not portable. You can get functional data, but you need experts in your hospital who are used to interpreting these images. Otherwise, the, the data is lost. There is a contrast uh, penalty and there's a radiation penalty. But again, in these acutely unwell patients, for me, this is not an issue that you should worry about at all. CT for acute aortic syndrome, well established. This is a study looking at using ultra high pitch or what we call uh, pseudo gating or flash CT angiography in order to minimize motion in the ascending aorta. Same patient with a scan done a number of hours apart, showing what looks like an, uh, a, a dissection tear in the ascending aorta, but clearly not one on the subsequent imaging. This is a patient who basically just had motion artifact and it was misinterpreted as motion as a dissection flap as opposed to motion. And this can be a very stressful diagnosis to make because you know as a radiologist what the implications are of calling that. And so you want to use all the technology that you have available to you in order to optimize imaging. And so the way we do that is with a technique called ultra high pitch imaging. And what we do is we actually move the patient through the scanner extremely quickly. So in other words, the table moves really, really fast. And what that allows you to do is essentially freeze the motion in the ascending aorta uh, to be able to, uh, to minimize movement. You can do this with ECG gating. In other words, the machine will actually monitor the patient's ECG and trigger the scan between two QRS complexes to again, minimize the movement. And depending on the scanner that you have, these tables can move anywhere from you know, two and two and a half meters a second to five and a half meters per second. And so obviously the faster you move your patient through the scanner, the less the motion is. However, you need to make sure that the scanner that you're using is able to uh, reinterpret that data and that you don't have a lot of interpolation problems with the data because the patients move so fast through the scanner. And so it's good to have your radiologists on board and so that they can help you optimize these imaging parameters. This is another a work in progress. This is motion reduction algorithm with CT. So a patient scanned without uh, ultra high pitch CT, which is then reconstructed to get rid of the motion artifact completely. I think this will come in the next few years. Transophageal echo, it's portable. There's real time information. There's no radiation penalty and you get functional data. The problem is that there's limited aortic assessment. As you know, there's no 3D assessment. It's very operator dependent and therefore you need the expertise on hand to be able to utilize this resource and you have to sedate your patient because it's an invasive procedure. So it's very limited again in the acute phase. Good if you if there are questions with regards to the ascending aorta and the integrity of the ascending aorta because it, it influences care so much. MRI, I'll talk about this for a bit because I think it's important not in the acute phase but more in the subacute and chronic phase. There's no radiation, there's no nephrotoxicity. You get a 3D assessment of the aorta if you want it, you can get functional data or at least data that shows you flow direction and flow velocity, and you can get a complete aortic assessment, but you're limited in terms of access and expertise at the hospitals that you work at. And this is not to be disparaging, but you do want to make sure that the radiologists who are interpreting these images are very comfortable interpreting acute aortic pathology or at least aortic pathology using these advanced MRI techniques. Setup and imaging time can be very prohibitive because it does take time to scan these patients and it's an investment, but it's definitely worth it. Uh, you need the expertise to report it and you often have to sedate these patients because they can be claustrophobic. So I use it as a problem solver. So I do not use MRI at all in my acute workup of patients uh, because of the penalties as I've just alluded to, but definitely post-treatment and in the subacute phase, it can be extremely helpful.
And here's where this is a patient who was stented, uh, who then did a time resolved MRI on post because there was residual flow in the false lumen. And as you can see from this MRI scan, there's both anti grade and retrograde re entry flow. So, anti grade re entry flow, just because, again, the stent sizing, because of how we size stents for dissection, we tend to size them smaller than for aneurysmal disease there can sometimes be um, a, uh, an anti-grade re-entry leak into the false lumen. And this is often, you know, because you have a very short landing zone of healthy aorta because you don't want to revascularize the entire arch. This is just the same time resolved MRI very slowly, just so you can see that anti-grade flow proximally and the retrograde flow distally. And the reason I do this is because you generally have to be more aggressive with your therapy when you're treating anti-grade re-entry flow as opposed to retrograde re-entry flow. And then this is a non-contrast white blood MRI sequence. Uh, I know when you look at it, it looks fantastic. It is fantastic. It's an isotropic voxel acquisition, so you can, re, um, uh, you can reconstitute these in any plane that you want. Uh, the problem is it can take a long time to acquire, so it absolutely has no place in acute imaging. Intravascular ultrasound, uh, this is fantastic for intraprocedural imaging. It's high resolution, you get real-time information. And what that means is that you can assess for numbers of fenestrations, complexity of the fenestrations. You can look for dynamic obstruction in your visceral vessels. And also you can resize your landing zone if there is a question of landing zone size and issues with the landing zone. And the other very important thing with intravascular ultrasound is that you can follow your catheter all the way from your your groin access all the way up into the aortic arch and make sure that you remain in the true lumen throughout. Because the worst mistake you can make is going from true lumen into false lumen back into true lumen and not even knowing it because you can potentially stent from true into false lumen and that can be catastrophic and devastating for the patient. It is expensive, access is limited and it's an invasive procedure. You know, the uh, Ivis catheter that you need to assess the aorta goes through a nine French sheath. So, you need, to, you need to bear that in mind. And there is a learning curve, obviously, but again, cardiology have really got a lot of um, experience with the intravascular ultrasound. They use it a lot. And so use them or anyone in your hospital who has experience with IVUS as a resource to help you through your learning curve. This is a patient who had a chronic dissection, had an aortic arch replacement with reimplantation of the left subclavian artery, very short landing zone. We didn't want to revascularize the subclavian because this patient had already had a period of transient paraplegia post-op after the arch surgery. And so what we did was we actually used intravascular ultrasound to mark out the surgical graft. And at the same time, uh, it gave us the opportunity to mark the subclavian artery and actually deploy the graft under ultrasound guidance right at the level of that subclavian artery and utilize all the landing zone that we have. And so you can see that's a pre and post. Left is pre, right is post. And as you can see, we're going through this is surgical graft. Uh, and as we go through, you'll see the origin of that left subclavian artery and then immediately distal to that left subclavian artery origin is the uh, artifact from the stem graft. And so here you can see the stent graft, there you can see the subclavian artery origin, and now we're in stent graft itself. And I'll push the catheter forward. There you can see there the origin of the subclavian artery open, patent. And then this is the CT post-operatively, just to show you the flow, residual flow in that uh, subclavian artery. So, you know, maximize the landing zone using uh, real-time intravascular ultrasound to help guide your stent graft deployment. This is a supplement from Endovascular Today, published in November 2019. Uh, I was very fortunate enough to be asked to write a piece on imaging, which covers the majority of what I've spoken about in this talk, but it'll just give you an opportunity to then put the imaging together with some very, very important uh, physicians who work in the di aortic dissection realm, who talk about results from stable trials, um, as well as both proximal and distal ceiling zones for type B dissection and building a multidisciplinary team, which is what we have at the hospital that I work at, which I think is absolutely key to optimizing patient care. So in summary, imaging is absolutely key for diagnosis, treatment planning, and follow-up. It's the mainstay of acute imaging for sure. You should not be using MRI in the acute phase regardless. Renal function is a secondary consideration. Please bear that in mind. You know, if you have a patient in acute renal failure, often is, if they have an acute dissection, it's because they're malperfusing. It's not because they have some underlying condition. They may have, but do not uh, compromise on your imaging. Uh, and then remember that MRI is a problem-solving tool in dissection. Oh.